problem. A team with a story of invention. A true architect of modern F1 with a story that goes back to the birth of Formula One. This story has its origins in 1955. Back then, Fangio was the undisputed king of F1. Amid that backdrop, an Australian, Jack Brabham, made his debut for Cooper, a team which had never set the world alight. All that would change in 1957. Cooper would introduce a revolutionary mid-engined car. The technical innovation gave Cooper the edge, and by 1959, Brabham took his maiden victory at Monte Carlo. He'd end the season as champion, with the team winning the constructors. He was even more dominant in 1960, winning five consecutive races out of a possible eight. Brabham's title defense was disastrous, and he left, but not before he'd have the final say. The Australian teamed up with a guy called Ron Turanak, and together they founded motor racing developments. But things would only spring into life when Brabham hired Dan Gurney. Now if you're unfamiliar with Gurney, he's the guy who invented the Gurney flap as well as the lift and coast technique. And thanks to his technical insight, he helped the team develop its way into competitiveness, taking Brabham's first podium with third at Spa, and a year later, the team's maiden win at Rouen. But just as Brabham was starting to gather some momentum, the FIA hit the sport with a major regulation change. Engine size would be doubled, from 1.5 to 3 litres. Now regulation changes can make or break a team, depending on how well they adapt, and Brabham rose to the challenge. The supply of Repco engines proved quick and reliable, enabling Jack to win his third title and his team's first in the process. He'd also made history as he became the first and only driver to win the championship in a car he'd built, a record which stands even today. Denny Holm, his teammate, won the championship in 67, with the team again winning the constructors. But if Brabham thought it was the start of a long period of dominance, Lotus hit back with the DFV. The DFV propelled Lotus to the top, while Brabham slid down the order a slide which wasn't resolved with a switch to the DFV. Despite the drop-off in results, Brabham took one final win at the 1970 South African Grand Prix, and at 44 years of age, he quit, this time for good, leaving the team in the hands of Ron Toranak. By 1973, the team had changed hands again to a Mr. Bernard Ecclestone. Bernie inherited a team which was on its last legs, with a combined total of 12 points in 1971 and 72. But Bernie being Bernie, he rung the changes. In came a South African designer who nobody had heard of, and out went Graham Hill and Wilson Fittipaldi. And if that sounds crazy, it's because you've never heard of Gordon Murray. Murray is the guy who pioneered the modern day pit stop, the fan car, and was also partly responsible for designing the MP44, which won 15 out of 16 races. With Murray on board, Carlos Reutemann took three victories, but the team was blighted by unreliability and a string of underwhelming second drivers. Better consistency allowed the team to finish second in 75, but just as soon as the team was starting to become competitive, the team switched from the DFV to the Alfa Romeo engine. That meant that the team went from podium regulars to a grand total of just 9 points while Hunt took the title. But, just as quickly as the team was on the back foot, it was back on the up. With the hiring of Nicolauda in 78, the team returned to winning ways, but not without controversy. While Lotus was dominating with the Lotus 79, Brabham like the other teams, was at a loss to figure out ways to close the gap. With the team running the Alpha engine, which was a boxer flat 12, it was impossible to maximize ground effect aerodynamics, but Murray had an ace up his sleeve. His first great innovation was to stick a fan to the back of the car to suck it to the ground. And at first glance you may say, well, that's illegal, but haha, 
The rules at the time stated that a movable device primarily used to generate downforce was not allowed. But designers don't simply read what a rule says. They also read what the rule doesn't say. So what Murray did was argue and prove that the fan was primarily used for cooling with the side effect of generating a ton of downforce. Amazingly, the FIA deemed it legal and the fan car, as it came to be known, proved its pace at Anderstorp. The team covered the fan with a dustbin lid. Yeah, but its pace was undeniable. In qualifying, the cars qualified towards the front, which wasn't bad, especially when you consider that they were running full tanks of fuel. Even more impressive was that Lauda won on the car's debut. Yet, as ever, there were more factors at play. Bernie Ecclestone was still the owner of the team and was also taking a more prominent role within the sport. So much so that he'd become the president of FOCA, the Constructors Association. In order to preserve his standing, he withdrew the BT46B. And the team followed up the 78 season with just 7 points in 79. The cause of the team's downward trajectory was the Alpha engine. Too big for ground effect and too unreliable to finish races, amassing a total of 20 retirements. And so, the team switched back to the DFV. Before 1980, the team built itself around Nelson Piquet, and with the DFV, the team was able to finally adopt ground effect aerodynamics. And it showed, with PK winning three races and the team recovering to third in the standings. But the real story happened in the driver's standings. In what was a proto 1986 or 2007, the Williams pair of Alan Jones and former Brabham driver Carlos Reutemann went to war over the championship. The fratricidal battle kept PK in the hunt, and as Reutemann faltered, the Brazilian snuck through to win his first championship. But rather than build on the success, Brabham once again opted for change. The turbo revolution was starting to take hold of the sport, and the team partnered up with BMW. The driver lineup was also changed, with Hector Rebac being replaced by Riccardo Patrese. But unlike 1966, these changes did not quite have the desired effect. The BMW was unreliable, and the team scored nearly as many points with the Ford-powered 1981 car as it did with the 1982 car. But the team also started experimenting with pit stops, with Murray feeling that the overall race pace would be quicker if the car was to change tires and refuel mid-race. It was an experiment which generally met a smoky end, but the pain was worthwhile. The BMW engine, Piquet and Patrese and the pit stop strategies all came together to place the team third in the standings, while Piquet became the sport's first ever turbo power champion. They weren't to know it at the time, but it would be the last time that Brabham ever won a championship in either category, and within a decade, the Brabham team name would disappear. Now the first part of this video will feel like a historical piece on the team. In this second part, we'll go through the factors which ultimately broke Brabham. What set things in motion was a combination of factors. The team had built its success with the quadrumvirate of Ecclestone, Murray, Piquet and BMW. And we'll go through each of those. Ecclestone, now taking on an ever more important role within the sport, had practically lost interest in the team, leaving day-to-day -day running to Gordon Murray. Murray, for his part, would start suffering from burnout with all the additional responsibilities resulting in less competitive cars. With the team losing competitiveness, PK left for Williams at the end of 1985. And, though the team still had the very, very powerful BMW engines, the reliability, which was required to consistently compete for a championship, was gone. All these things took place within two years of BK's title win in 83. 
It meant that the team's final gamble came in 1986, with Gordon Murray revolutionizing aerodynamics. But the new low-line chassis failed to deliver the goods, being super quick down the straights, but not generating enough downforce. By the end of that season, Murray himself was gone. With the team now effectively on life support, Ecclestone failed to register Brabham in time to compete in the 1988 season, so he sold it off, and it raced on never finishing higher than ninth in the standings until it ran out of money midway through 1992.